Hey there, everybody. Hopefully you guys can hear me okay. If you guys will let me know in the chat once you can hear my audio coming through. Hopefully everybody's doing great. Um, we've got a few things that I caught topics I want to cover tonight. And then uh, after that, I will get to some questions uh, that I've gotten through email and uh, different stuff. And then we'll go from there. Um, I just want to kind of get a thumbs up from the chat here. If you guys are watching this stream and you're not part of it live, there's a chat that goes on while we're in the stream. So, um, cool. All right. Everybody hear me okay? Right on. Sweet. Okay. So we're going to get into this today. So today, um, I don't really have, uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll talk about the videos that I uploaded this past week. Uh, sorry, I was late on the Friday video. I just uploaded that last night. Um, but I went ahead and uploaded another one today. So that way I kind of made up for it. Uh, the first thing that I kind of want to start out talking about is just um, troubleshooting, okay? Um, I've, I've preached this a bunch of times, and I'm kind of going to go over it again. And uh, the um, it's just going to be me moving closer to the, the mic there, bud. So um, what I want to uh, talk about is, you know, my little motto that I go by, and that is looking at the big picture. Okay. And I'll give you guys some examples with something that happened today. But, you know, uh, the, the phrase that I kind of use a lot is let's take a step back. Let's think about it. Let's look at the big picture. Okay. And let's solve the problem, not the symptom. Okay. This sounds cheesy. It sounds corny. But if you guys can go into your service calls with that in mind, it will really help you guys. Okay. And it'll help you to, instead of just solving the problem, you know, which is a bad compressor. We're going to look at the big picture and come up with a solution for everything. Okay. Or I should have said solve the symptom. Okay. Um, because compressors don't just go bad. Something caused that compressor to go bad, whether it was bad electrical connections on the contactor, whether it was, um, you know, a flooding expansion valve that was, uh, washing the oil out of the compressor, you know, it's always important, and especially when we, we diagnose things, and especially when we put quotes in for things, that we, um, we put room in our quotes for after we repair you know, the symptom. So if we have a bad compressor, let's make sure that we have enough time in our quote to spend some time diagnosing after we spend eight hours changing that compressor, right? Maybe a follow-up visit is within your quote or, you know, make sure that the customers sign off on that stuff, knowing that you wanted to do a follow-up visit. Okay. It's very important. And again, I know some of you guys have heard this stuff, but you know, it's, it's that stuff that really helps us. So today I had a service call. Um, it was at a new customer, someone I'd never been to before. Um, it was a, uh, it was actually a, uh, a local hotel and uh, the service call was very vague. It was that they had a reach in that wasn't working. And they really didn't give me very many specifics. It was kind of confusing because they were talking about, well, actually, I know where this hotel is and it's a big one and there's no parking. And I tried asking them about parking. And this is the kind of stuff that goes into a business. So for those of you that are just service techs, on the flip side, answering the phones, here's what I'm dealing with. I get a, a, a receptionist calling me saying, hey, we, we have a service call. We need you to come out and work on some drawers. And I ask them for details. And they say, well, all we know is it's not working. So then I ask them, okay, so you know, we fill, forward them all of our billing information. And once they get all our billing information and we get approved and we give them our insurance certs and everything, you know, then they say, okay, you know, when can you come out? So we schedule a time. And then as I call this morning to, to make sure that they're ready for me, I ask them, you know, where am I going to park? And they say, well, you just park in the parking structure. And I go, yes, yeah, see, parking structures aren't going to work for a service van. So do you have a loading dock that I can park on? No, we don't. You know, if you park in the parking structure, we can validate your parking. It, okay. You know, so I went there. I couldn't fit in the parking structure. So I ended up figuring it out. But once I got inside, I was escorted by maintenance and maintenance took me over there. And I listened to what maintenance had to say. Okay, because maintenance is the people that have been working on this unit. And I said, okay, so what is the problem? Uh, they say, well, it's not working. And I go, okay, well, I walk up to it. The breaker was off. Uh, the box was at 70 degrees. And I said, but what was happening before you guys called me? And he said, well, we've been having freeze up problems on this unit consistently. The unit has been freezing up every other day. Okay, cool. So now I have an idea as to what the problem was. Now, I also instructed him that 
it, for future, you know, I would prefer they just leave the unit on because I would rather come up to it frozen up so that way I didn't have to probe them trying to figure out what was going on. I'd prefer to see the ice up situation so that way I can diagnose from that because a freeze up can can tell you a lot depending on how it's frozen up. Is it just half the coil? Is it a quarter of the coil? You know, all kinds of stuff like that. Okay. So, but you know, anyways, it was already defrosted by the time I got there. And uh, what I did was I turned the circuit breaker on. And immediately when I turned the circuit breaker on, I saw what I thought the problem was. Okay. And it was part of it. It was a symptom. Well, it was, it was part of the problem, but uh, the, it had a Ronco electronic temperature controller mounted by the condensing unit. And it immediately said 120 degrees on the Ronco temperature controller. So, and mind you, it was like 60 degrees in the box. So what I did just to verify was I, I had uh, the, the field piece um, job link probes and I put one inside the box and then I came back to the condensing unit and I let it run for a minute and I went ahead and gauged up on it and I confirmed that, yeah, it was like 60 degrees in the box and, and the temperature controller was reading 100 degrees. So I went through the settings to make sure that everything was working properly on the control and uh, the settings were fine. I didn't see any memory loss or anything. If you guys are familiar with the Ronco controls, they can have a, a EPROM failure where they have memory loss, but I didn't see that. So I went ahead and got approval from them to go ahead and change, to try to change the temperature sensor, the thermistor on the end. So tested it, it tested bad, changed the thermistor, and I got the box to start reading the correct temperature. Now, again, I'm making assumptions that this is what was causing the, the unit to freeze up. This was a refrigerator, it wasn't a freezer. It was just a two drawer unit. And, um, you know, I, I'm again, just going through, doing the best of my ability, making educated guesses. And I don't tell the customer that, but it's true because I didn't see the condition. I didn't see it iced up. So I have to make an educated guess. Uh, found a bad temperature sensor. The temperature controller thought it was 100 degrees in the box when it was 60 degrees in the box. So what would happen? The box would continue to run because it would never satisfy. And it would freeze up. Okay. But I don't just stop there. All right. I could have, but I'm going to look at the big picture. Go ahead and uh, gauge up, run the system, check the sight glass. The sight glass was flashing. Okay. So that's one other thing, but I'm going to go ahead and watch the box come down to temp. And I noticed something that the box came down to temperature really fast. Okay. And when it did, what I noticed was my, uh, my field piece uh, job link probe. I just had the return air probe in there. I noticed that that temperature came down to 24 degrees when the, the probe for the temperature controller was still saying in the 40s. And I was like, huh, that's kind of odd. It came down pretty quick. Maybe my, maybe my, my temperature probe was getting uh, supply air somehow or recirculating the supply air. So I just let the box operate and I let it satisfy. But then what I noticed is when the box satisfied, again, this is a refrigerator, when it satisfied, my field piece job link probe read the identical temperature of the Ronco temperature controller. So, okay, that confirmed to me that the Ronco temp control sensor that I just installed was reading the accurate temperature, but something was going on with uh, the air because the, the, the field piece job link probe was reading a lot colder while it was running, okay? Kind of had an assumption, but watch the box operate. I went ahead and uh, while I had my gauges on the unit, I went ahead and when it uh, turned back on, I cleared up the sight glass. It took less than a, you know, right about a pound, less than a pound of gas and um, did a leak check on the, the condensing unit uh, while it was shut off. Um, nothing, no, no traces. I did find some, uh, some caps on it that the, the seals weren't very good and they were kind of full of rust and whatnot. So, you know, uh, recommended replacing the caps. But um, before I finished up, I, like I said, I saw the box come down to temp, but before I finished up, I went back over to the evaporator coil and I took a piece of paper and I put it up to the fan motor. And I noticed that the fan motor was spinning in the wrong direction. So if you can picture this, this kind of looked like an Omni temp evaporator coil, similar, okay, but it actually had an axial fan motor. It was a custom unit. So it had an axial fan motor as the evaporator fan motor. And the fan motor was sucking air into the coil and blowing it out the drain pan. Now this isn't that type of a unit. So I knew something wasn't right about that. What was interesting is according to the customer, this unit was installed three years ago and nobody's ever worked on it. This is the first time it broke down, which kind of blew my mind that the fan motor was running backwards this entire time. And it kind of made me wonder how this thing ever temped properly either. So it was real simple. I went ahead and flipped the fan motor around. So that way it was drawing air in through the bottom of the unit, the drain pan and blowing it out the fan motor out into the box, which is the way this is supposed to work. And uh, that would also explain why 
I saw that really cold temperature on my my job link probe. Okay, my job link probe reads the temperature a lot faster than the Ronco temperature controller. Okay, so um, it it uh, it basically explained what was going on with that. Again, this is taking a step back and looking at the big picture. Okay, so um, the symptom was the box was freezing up. Okay. I found a couple things wrong. We found that the temperature sensor had, uh, it was bad and it was reading a lot warmer. It was making the temperature controller think that it was a hundred degrees in the box when it was 60 degrees. Okay. Then I found that the unit was a little low on refrigerant. I topped off the charge. I also did a leak check on the evaporator and found nothing. So I told the customer just to keep an eye on that. Um, but then I also found that the evaporator fan motor was going in the wrong direction. Okay. So we're, we're, we're looking at the big picture, but before I left, uh, you know, I instructed the customer about other things that could cause the unit to freeze up. I noticed that they had an excessive amount of defrosts inside the defrost clock. So I'm talking every, what did they, what was it? Every hour and a half or every two hours, they had a 15 minute defrost throughout the day. So it was like this thing would run for two hours, then defrost, run for two hours, then defrost. My assumption, again, I'm making an educated guess because I'm not the person that normally maintain this unit. My assumption was they'd been having this freeze up problem for a long time and they were trying to remedy it by, uh, you know, adjusting the defrost clock. It's also possible that someone tried to remedy it by flipping that fan motor around. I don't know. It was hard to tell whether or not it had been worked on. Uh, it didn't look like it had been flipped around in a long time to me, but, you know, who knows. So, big picture diagnosis, okay? Everything was good after I left, after I corrected all the issues, and the customer was very happy. I also educated the customer on you know door gaskets and uh or drawer gaskets i should call them because it was a two drawer unit and uh drawer wheels and drawer closing hardware and making sure that the 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 cooks and the kitchen staff were closing all the drawers okay um as i was working you know i was talking with the customer uh, because it was the maintenance staff so i was you know very open to explaining everything that i was doing to him because he was interested he was asking me because you know he 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 knows a little bit about refrigeration and so he was just like well why did you do this and and i just explained to him you know before i took my service gauges off on there because i was looking at the big picture i did a a pump down test on the suction service valve to test to see if the compressor would pull into a vacuum on the suction side uh, you know, just, just big picture looking at everything just to be safe. And, you know, when I did that, he asked me, well, why are you testing the compressor suction valve? And I explained to him, this is what can happen, you know, and, and went through all the steps. Okay. So the reason why I bring that up was it was the perfect scenario where I wish I could have filmed it, but unfortunately because of the, um, you know, it's just like a kind of a fancy hotel and, and I knew it just didn't, it didn't have the right vibe to be able to open up my camera and bring it in there and start, you know, filming stuff. So that's why I wanted to bring this up because this was one of those things where I wish I could have so that I could show this is the steps we went through. Um, you know, this is why we did that. Uh, I think that that's really important, you know, and one of the things that I talk to my guys about, and this is just, just the way that I go about is I will listen to what the kitchen staff says, you know, and I will take their, what they say, you know, and, and put it in the back of my mind but I usually am going to listen to the management or the maintenance staff, okay? Because, and, and if the kitchen staff tells me something that contradicts the management or what the maintenance staff has told me, then I will bring that up to the management or the maintenance staff and say, look, you're telling me one thing, your kitchen staff's telling me the other, what do you want me to do? And the reason why I do that, this is actually something that came up in my company the other day, nobody did anything wrong, but the reason why I do that is, is because we've been led astray by kitchen staff before where we have a guy that goes out, uh, says hi to the manager, and then you know, goes into the kitchen and asks the cooks what region's not working, and the cooks say, oh, it's this one. And so he starts working on it, and he's two hours into it, and then the manager comes over and says, what are you doing? That's not the region that I called you about. You know, They don't know what they're talking about. And you know, it was one of those things where they actually had another region that was down, but the manager was upset with us because that wasn't the one that they called us about. And they didn't want us to work on that region. So communication is a big thing about troubleshooting too and communicating with the right people. Uh, uh, thanks a lot, Zach. I appreciate it, man. Um, you know, communication with the right people, talking to, um, you know, the, the management and, and getting the management's approval before we do things. I'll give you another example. We had, this was, and again, nothing that we did wrong, but this was a couple years back 
probably two years ago, we sent someone out to install a lettuce crisper. And a lettuce crisper is essentially they, a couple different companies make them. I think this one was made by Glastoner. It hangs on the wall and it just has a hopper in it and it holds all the lettuce, okay? And they can pull their lettuce out and make salads. So they're kind of awkward and they're top heavy. That's the other thing that's tricky about them because the compressor was usually located in the top of it. So when you would go to lift it off the wall, it would hang on a bracket or sit on a shelf. When you go to lift it off the wall, if you didn't know how heavy they were, it was kind of, you know, they, they were a little misleading because it looked like two people could do it, but it was really a three to four person job to get these things off the wall. So anyways, what had happened was, um, you know, my guy went over there and, and grabbed three of the cooks and said, hey guys, can you give me a hand? And as they were, thank you so much, Nasty. I appreciate it, man. As they were um, dropping the lettuce crisper off the wall, they had a couple cooks. And then my guy, one of the cooks, just decided to let go of the lettuce crisper. And the whole thing dropped and smashed on the ground, um, dented the whole side of the lettuce crisper. And it wasn't good. And the cook that dropped it was acting like he was hurt, you know, and it was not a good situation. So, my tech did not do anything wrong. In fact, he probably held on to it too long himself because he was trying to stop it from dropping and he probably hurt himself a little bit, okay? In a situation like that, I would tell my guys to protect yourself. If you've got to drop something, you've got to drop it. But the reason why I tell this story is when the manager came over, the manager was completely frustrated and upset because they had no idea that we had asked the kitchen staff to help them lift that unit off the wall, okay? Again, communication. It's a big thing about troubleshooting and helps, okay? The manager, it, there was nothing that we did wrong. But like I, after everything, we, you know, we were fine. I, t I deal with facilities and everything was good. Nothing that we did bad on our side. But the way that, that I talked to our technician is, is it was a learning experience. Look, this is what we do. Even if you know the cooks themselves or the kitchen staff are, are perfectly capable of helping you, what I always do is run things through the manager, OK, because then it puts the liability on the manager. So instead of us saying, well, we asked these three guys and they said they would help us. If we'd have done it the other way, we would have walked to the manager and said, hey, I need three of your guys to help me out. Can you go get them for me and and ask them to come help me? Then that lets the manager be the responsible one that picked those cooks. And then I'll usually even ask the manager to come over there. And would you mind just kind of supervising that way they can see. So that way they see everything that's going on. OK, so. You know, just some advice about communication. That's what I'm just trying to bring up. Communication, okay? This all goes into troubleshooting. And I guess we're kind of getting into, you know, ethics and how we deal with restaurants and different things too, okay? Um, if you're new to the channel, uh, you know, I just want to kind of do a little introduction. My name is Chris. I do these live streams Monday night. I upload two videos a week, Mondays and Fridays. And then these live streams are a way for me to answer questions. So I usually start out with an educational topic, something to talk about for the first 20 minutes or so, and then I'll get into questions and different things. Okay. Um, so I gave you guys the examples again, big picture diagnosis. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I, I can't stress that enough looking at the big picture. Okay. It, it takes you a little more time, but you look a lot better when you submit a quote, granted the quotes a few bucks more than the next guy, but you're saying we're going to solve the problem. You know, the other guy's saying, we're just going to change the compressor. I'm saying, I'm going to change the compressor. Then I'm going to spend a couple hours diagnosing further and telling you exactly what caused that compressor to go bad. Okay. Big picture diagnosis. Um, I'll get to the chat here in a few minutes, guys. A couple more things I want to cover. Another example that we had was we had a, a kitchen staff that we went to a restaurant to install a new refrigerator that the restaurant had ordered. We said hi to the manager when we arrived. And, uh, but then, uh, our service tech went into the kitchen and he had a new refrigerator that was out on the back dock. So he unpackaged it, uh, uncrated it, plugged it in, made sure it came down to temperature. Then he took it into the kitchen and asked the cooks, Hey, which, which refrigerator are we replacing? And the cook said, Oh, that one right there. So my service tech pulled the, ref the old refrigerator out, put it on the back dock, pushed the new refrigerator in, went out onto the back dock, recovered the gas, uh, asked one of the kitchen staff to come help him load the refrigerator into our trailer. And then he took the trailer and went and dumped the refrigerator. Uh, went up to the manager, got an invoice signature, said we were good. Manager was happy. And uh, we uh, he went to the dump, threw the refrigerator out in the dump. Everything was good. And then we got a call back the next day and said we changed the wrong refrigerator. They still have a refrigerator that wasn't working. Now, granted, there's a lot of fault on the management staff in that whole situation. But had our tech 
communicated with the manager, grabbed the manager by the hand, said, which refrigerator am I changing? You know, where does it go? Made the manager, you know, be part of the, 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 the decision making instead of asking the kitchen staff. Because guess what? The kitchen staff don't pay us. They could tell us anything they want. You know, it doesn't matter because the manager is the one that's paying us or the manager is approving the payment, you know, that corporate's paying us. So communication, it's those things. Okay. You know, one of the things I try to share in my videos is, is the mistakes that I've made. And these are the mistakes that we as a company have made. And, you know, yes, there's a lot of fault on the management staff, but it also falls on us because we have to deal with all the headaches and, 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 you know, the service tech, eh, it doesn't fall on him so much, but me in the office, that's what we have to deal with. You know, on a daily basis, it's silly stuff like that. My tech didn't do anything wrong. There's just certainly things we could have done to help the situation. Same thing goes for buying a compressor from the supply house. Hey, I need this compressor. Okay, no problem. Get to the supply house, pick up the compressor, go out to the job, rope it up to the roof, go ahead and install the compressor, and then find out it's a 460 volt compressor and you needed a 208 three phase. So there's some fault on the, the supply house there. But most of it's on you because you didn't verify. You assumed that the supply house gave you the right part. Okay. I like my supply houses. No offense to them. I don't trust them. I always double check because it's going to be me at the end of the day that has to answer for the mistakes to the customer, to my boss, to whoever. Okay. So, you know, in a situation like that, you're kind of up a, up a creek without a paddle, right? That's kind of a problem. So communication. Okay, verifying that things are correct, looking at the big picture. Don't just assume and don't just go into things, you know, like everything's going to be super easy and, and you know, you, you always got to question and, and go through that stuff, okay? All right, guys, um, I am going to start with the questions. I had a very interesting question. I don't know if you're in the chat right now. I did invite you to the live stream. Uh, I had a question just before I went live, and it was from a high school student. And uh, let me pull up the question here. And it was very interesting. It says, um, it says, hey, I've recently found your channel and uh, it seems to like the subject. And he was wondering if he should get in this career, how much it requires as far as education goes, and if there's a livable wage. And he says he's still in high school. So he's just asking, okay? If you're watching that, you didn't give me your name, but to you... I say yes to anybody out there that is interested in this trade, okay? If any of you guys are in the chat or watching this stream and you're thinking about it, this is a great trade, okay? It is what you make it, okay? If you choose to be lazy and you choose to not be thorough, it can be miserable, okay? If you, if you, if you get frustrated easily, it's a little difficult, okay? It's a challenging trade. You know, on any given day, we as HVAC technicians, and I'm just talking about myself, I'm talking to everybody that's watching this, we are forced to be electricians, plumbers, you know, uh, customer service people, um, refrigeration guys. I mean, we do a lot. Okay. So it is a very good trade, but it is also a very challenging trade. It can be very rewarding if you get into the right area, the right field of what you like to do. Um, I would suggest that this would not be for someone that is not mechanically inclined. If you're not mechanically inclined, maybe you need to get into a management position, some kind of an office position or a sales position. Okay. Um, this is definitely a good trade. Now, uh, as far as the pay goes, it changes all over the place. Okay. So here in Southern California, uh, an apprentice can expect to make anywhere from 15 to $18 an hour starting out. Okay. And that all depends on how much education he has. Okay. And I'll get into the education in a minute. Um, you know, experienced technicians, if your stuff don't stink, you're going to be making 35 and up. Uh, if you've got a little bit of learning, you're going to be making around the, just under, you know, the 20 to 35 range. I mean, and, and then depending on the type of, of the field, you know, the area of the field that you get into heavy industrial and stuff like that, you can make $55 an hour and up. I mean, it, the sky is the limit, okay? But it's all dependent on your abilities and how much you can handle, okay? Uh, do you want to get into management? All kinds of stuff, okay? But you got to start from the bottom. It's I think it's very important that people in here remember that just because you graduated a trade school does not mean that you're going to start making 
you know, in my area, $35 an hour because you're not, okay? Even if you went through two years of schooling, and I'm sorry if you paid ridiculous amounts of money through a, a private trade school, but even if you paid that ridiculous amount of money, you're not going to start, uh, you know, making $30 an hour. It's just not going to happen. You are going to have to work your way up. I will say that all across the United States and around the world, I would even say, is that, well, at least in North America, wages are going up. Okay, wages are going up because there's a demand for service technicians. Uh, we have a skills gap, blah, blah, blah. You know all that stuff. You guys have all heard it. So we have a massive shortage of service technicians in the entire construction industry. And wages are going up because there's less of us out there. Obviously, we get to ask for more money. Okay, so wages are going up. But just because you graduated trade school or went to trade school doesn't mean that you're going to start out making $35 an hour. You do have to work your way up. I would highly, highly suggest personal opinion, that you do not work for a service company that is going to throw you in a service van after you've ridden with someone for two months, okay? You have not learned enough to be on your own after two months of just riding with someone. Um, now, in a perfect world, I'd love to say I put my guys through a three-year apprenticeship, la di da di da That doesn't happen, okay? Um, but we evaluate them based on their skills. They ride with us for a while. And then depending on their skills, then we start to move them out. We branch them out. We put them into a service vehicle and we have them start, you know, meeting me at the job. Um, we have them start doing preventative maintenances, you know, little things, and then working their way up to being full service technicians. I imagine it's very similar with other service companies, but I just highly, highly discourage you from jumping in a service van or letting a service company put you on a service van too soon. Okay. It's going to do nothing but hurt you and hurt everybody else because they may be forced to give you a bigger wage, but then come the day you have to leave that service company and you go to work for another service company, just because you are making that much money at service company A doesn't mean you're going to make that at B because B wants you to have all the skills that you didn't have with service company A. So I suggest that you just act like a sponge and absorb everything that you can. And so for the guy from high school that sent me that email, yes, this is a great trade. Don't be discouraged from it. I would highly suggest personally what I appreciate as a business owner is when someone calls me and says, hey, I'm really interested in getting into the trade. Um, I have already enrolled in the local community college. I found that they had a trade or a trade class okay, for HVAC. Uh, I'm, I'm two months into my schooling and I was curious if you would be willing to hire someone that's already going to school and willing to learn. That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for someone that has shown me the drive that they've started to go to school before they even applied with me. Now, um, do I think that school is going to teach them everything? No. Okay. They're going to learn some from school. They're going to learn some from me or whoever else they're riding with. And then they're just going to have to learn some over time. There's research that you have to do on your own at night, um, you know, after work. What I'd suggest for those people that are being apprentices out there is, you know, if you are working with someone, don't walk around the roof with headphones, okay? Take the headphones off your head. Listen. Listen to the sounds. Even if you're doing something as boring as changing filters, just listen. Listen to what's normal. Listen to what you think isn't normal. Ask questions. Write down model numbers of that really weird looking piece of equipment over there that you don't know what it is. And when you go home, at the end of the day, after you're done changing those boring filters, Google that model number. Research about it. So then you can go to your boss and say, hey, while we were working there, I, uh, you know, you know, did the same thing. You know, I, I heard this noise or I read about this and it didn't seem right. That's the stuff that impresses me. Okay. When someone comes to me and says, hey, while I was there, it didn't sound right, so I did some research, and I found out that that noise is more than likely a, a bearing going bad on the motor, and then what do you think? And, and I appreciate those questions, okay? So, you know, it's, it's, it's a very good trade. So to, to answer that, that, guy's, that kid's question, yes, get into the trade, okay? And for anybody else interested in the trade, do it. It's a great, great field, but you have to be motivated. You have to have mechanical skills if you're going to get into service, um, there is other things you can do if you don't want to get into service. Okay. Supply houses need people, all kinds of stuff. All right. But this is a very good trade. Um, so that was the question on that. I kind of want to, uh, see if you guys have any questions in the chat. If you guys do go ahead and post them back down at the bottom. Okay. I'm going to slowly start reading from the bottom up, but I don't want to get lost all the way in the top. So anybody that has questions, go ahead and uh, post them and I'll try to answer them. Okay. 
Um, I'm going to just start reading here real quick. Yeah, it, you know, I'm still learning every day too. Brian Milburn just said that he's, uh, you know, still learning every day. And that's true. That's that's where I am. I'm learning every day, okay? Um, Todd, you want me to look at the camera? So here's the funny thing, Todd. I get enough of people telling me to stop looking at the camera because apparently I have steel eyes and I stare into their souls. So then I don't look at the camera and then people say that I'm not looking at the camera enough. So it's just kind of funny. Uh, I can't win. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. So total tech, you were thrown in a restaurant refrigeration with no schooling and trained for only a few months by a hack. It was crazy, but it did work out for you. And that's great that it did work out for you. Okay. I was in a similar situation. Um, love them to death. I, I, I started working for my dad a long time ago and I was kind of put in the same situation where I was just kind of thrown out there and I was taught a lot of things that were what I consider to be wrong. Okay, beer can cold and all kinds of different stuff. There was some some education in that stuff because some of those things I learned they were wrong and don't do them. Some of those things I I would ask like, okay, so why am I charging to, you know, just a certain pressure? I, I think I mentioned this recently was, um, you know, I can vividly remember being taught how to charge or check the refrigerant charge on an R22 package unit. And back in the day, we worked on a lot of carriers, but this was just the method that I was taught. And it was simply cover up the condenser or block off the, uh, the condenser fan motor discharge until your head pressure got to 275 PSI. I don't know why I still remember these numbers. Once your head pressure got to 275 PSI, I was told that your suction pressure should be at 65 PSI. And if it wasn't, you added gas until it was. Now, we all know that that's incorrect. Okay. I was never taught anything. And those were all uh, fixed orifice metering devices. So I was never taught anything about target superheat, um, you know, which is the right way to charge that system to check airflow and then adjust the refrigerant charge via while, while monitoring the target superheat. Okay. But you know, it, things were forgiving back then. Things aren't forgiving like that these days. So, you know, there was some value in what I was taught because, hey, they got it working and it worked. It just wasn't efficient. But back then, we didn't need to be as efficient. Okay. The equipment was less than 10 sear. Um, you know, you could overcharge a condensing unit and it was no big deal. Okay. Because there was enough storage room in that condenser for it to just sit in there and it wasn't a problem. Okay. But nowadays with micro channel condensers and you know, the, our, our system is much less forgiving. So we have to be accurate. Okay. And, uh, unfortunately the equipment that we have these days doesn't last as long. So it's less forgiving. It doesn't last as long and it's not so accepting to abuse. Okay, compressors, they can't handle liquid as much as they used to be able to back then. Okay, we're dealing with scroll compressors now. Sometimes certain scrolls can handle liquid, but some can't. Okay, back then it was all recips. And, uh, you know, so just things are different, but there's still value. Okay, so I was never a punk working with my dad. I never told him, you're wrong. I know you're wrong. I would always listen to what he had to say, but then I would go home and I would research and I would, you know, find what was inaccurate and, and, you know, and, and politely bring it up to him. Hey, you know, you told me to do this like this. And I'm just kind of curious why you said so, you know, and, 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 and this, you know, then I would explain, this is what I read. And, and that's how I bettered myself again, not knocking my dad because he did teach me a lot and I still work with him to this day. And, uh, you know, but it was just different times. Okay. So, all right, keep going into here. See what this, uh, and I, I also remember a time when we would clean condensers with R22. Uh, of course, that was all pre-1991 Montreal Protocol, 1992, whenever that was, of course, okay? It was all before then. But yeah, I remember cleaning condensers and blowing out drains with R22 because it was so cheap. It was nothing. Uh, you know, um, vacuum pumps, <laughs> those were a luxury. Recovery machines, those were a luxury, Okay. Things are different now. That wasn't the right way. I learned and we moved on. And I try to share those mistakes. And that's the whole point of my videos is, is I am not perfect whatsoever. And I try to share the mistakes that I have made. So that way, hopefully, you don't necessarily make all the same mistakes that I do. Okay. I, I think it's important that people still learn a little bit on their own. But I try to share that with you guys. So that way, you guys understand 
you know, and can learn from my mistakes. Okay. Cause I've made a lot of horrible mistakes that I hope you guys never make. So, okay. Keep going into here, seeing what I'm missing. Everybody that's come in here. Hey, how are you guys all doing? I really appreciate you guys coming into this stream. Okay. All right. Thanasis, you said the best book for apprentice learning on the job for refrigeration systems and electrical circuits. Okay. So, um, that's a hard one, Thanasis. You know, my favorite book for an existing service technician would be Commercial Refrigeration for Air Conditioning Technicians by Dick Wurz. But that is technically a book that is written for someone who's already an air conditioning technician that wants to learn refrigeration. I still think it's a great resource. So that's one of the books that I would highly suggest all of you pick up if you haven't already. And again, that's Commercial Refrigeration for Air Conditioning Technicians by Dick Wurz. Right now is the third edition um, highly suggest you guys get that book. Now, uh, as far as for a beginner, um, you know, I would say just the simple racked manual, the refrigeration and air conditioning technologies manual would be a good one. Um, you know, there's lots of good books out there. You know, a book isn't going to teach you everything. You need to be able to absorb what it tells you and use it out in the field. Okay. Uh, I definitely think that there's a lot of great resources that weren't even available for me when I started, you know, 17 years ago, whatever it was. Um, you know, so the, the, the internet is great, but the internet can also be bad. Okay. You get these funny guys that don't know what they're doing, making YouTube videos. Okay. So be cautious of those guys. They're kind of shady, right? I'm one of them. <laughs> All right. Um, R22 in attire, DJ sub air. Um, it's funny. Uh, Kel Kelda, Okay, so I can remember if any of you guys in this older guys in here remember the TV show Rescue 911. Okay, there was a TV show in the early 90s called Rescue 911, and this always stuck in my head. I was this was before I was in the trade, but I still remember uh, a recreation of a camping trip with an AC service technician, and it was so horrible because he went um, to uh, he went camping with his family. And he decided to fill up their air mattress with R22 refrigerant. So he filled up the air mattress with R22 refrigerant. And one of the kids, again, this was on TV, okay? But I just remember this. I don't know how serious it was. But I remember one of the kids suffocated because apparently he was breathing in the R22 through the holes in the air mattress or something like that. That was horrible. But I can't remember if the kids survived or not. But I just remember that episode of Rescue 911. And he filled up his air mattress with R22. So... Back in the day, R22 was, uh, yeah, it was so cheap. Same thing with R12. It was so cheap that you just, you know, you didn't, you, you even purged with that stuff. Most of the people, again, the, way before my time, but, you know, it was, it was common practice to just sweep the system with R12 and, you know, just push all the air out of the system and start it back up. You know, most of the people weren't using vacuum pumps and different things. But again, everything is so less forgiving to the, these days, okay, with the polyester oils. We, you know, moisture is a huge deal with mineral oil. It was easy. You just push the moisture out. No big deal. Okay. But with polyester oil, it's absorbed into the oil and it's hard to get it out and it causes problems with the system, um, that, that can lead to acid that can lead to burnouts and all kinds of things. Okay. So things are less forgiving. We have to follow the proper refrigeration practices. And we're also getting into some scary stuff because, um, I just did an episode coming up soon. I don't know when he's going to release it with Brian or a podcast about R290 refrigerant. And, um, you know, some of the, the, the things that we run into as service techs, you know, he, he also just did one with a manufacturer, but, you know, I just kind of give them a service technician's perspective of R290, and there's a lot of safety concerns when it comes to that stuff. So there's no room to cut corners when you're working with a lot of these new refrigerants, especially the hydrocarbon ones, because they're flammable, okay? You've got isobutane, you've got R290. That's not good if you make mistakes. If you fill that system with air, you can cause some big problems and try to mix that refrigerant, and then, yeah, it can be big and bad, okay? So we got to follow the proper refrigeration practices. Okay. Um, keep going. Yeah. 404 has taken that title and I'm really bummed out prime time that 404 is, uh, is bouncing out because 404 has done me so well. I love 404. Uh, it's a very low fractionation rate on 404, even though they call it a blend and they tell you to be afraid. It's, it's, you can, you can charge a 404 system without worrying about it half the time. It doesn't even matter if half the charge has been gone. The fractionation is so low. 404 is just, it is, I, I, I like 404 a lot other than the high discharge temps. That's, I really do like 404. So, okay. Keep going back up into here. Yeah. Purging with propane. That's right. 
keep going up into here, you guys. You got questions? Oh, nitrogen? Yeah. Nitro I remember putting nitrogen in our in our car tires um, when I lived up in the desert because, uh, you know, when we would put um, just the normal oxygen for air from the compressed air tank, you know, the, 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 the nitrogen wouldn't uh, fluctuate so much in pressure, so as much as the regular air did. Okay, um, keep going down into here. See what I'm missing, guys. Um, you know, my recent videos, uh, you guys, I'm not going to go all the way back up into the chat. So if you guys got something, put it down here in the bottom. Yeah, um, some of the uh, refrigeration units are starting to ship with 448. That's correct. Uh, that, that has been adopted by a couple manufacturers. So that's something new. Uh, you know, the heat craft units for... Uh, majority of the aftermarket coils you can buy, they're pretty much, you know, rated to be uh, certain BTUs with 448, with 407C, with R22, with 404. They give you a bunch of different options, you know, and the, the BTU output that they'll put out with that refrigerant. So it's a new thing coming out. Okay. Be cautious about these systems because uh, you want to make sure you're labeling stuff. And that this is another thing that started to happen in the mid 90s when we had all the R12 retrofits. You know, that were out there. There were so many of them. It's very similar to what we're going through right now is that nobody was labeling things and it ran, it just led into a big problem of guessing what refrigerants were in things. Okay. So it's very, very important that you guys label your refrigerants. And a Sharpie is not enough. You guys need to get the proper labels. I usually put three labels per system if I can. Okay. Or a paint marker, Sharpie, Sharpies fade off. So put a fit, a paint marker and then try to make sure that when you do, if you use a paint marker that you put it in a place where the sun's not going to beat on it and fade it really quick, but you need to be labeling your systems for the next guy. Okay. Because that's nothing but a headache trying to figure out what refrigerants in a system, especially when it's one of these new blends. That's just a nightmare. Total tech. That's a great question. What is going on with my podcast? Uh, it's just me being lazy and not doing it. Uh, I currently have uh, paid for podcast hosting. I have uh, a pod. I've paid for a website. I've done it all. I just haven't recorded the podcast yet. I've even actually I've recorded a few podcasts. I just haven't edited them down. I've even got like papers written out. So it's just me being lazy. Total tech. So I need to do it. I know. I'm sorry. I will get to it. Originally aired in 92. Is that the episode of Rescue 911, Todd, that you're talking about? I, I just saw your thing right there. I don't know if that's what you were talking about, Todd. That that sounds like something. Okay. All right. Okay, so Gary Black, you said, what does a swamp cooler do? You're sure you won't see one on the East Coast in Maryland. So a swamp cooler is, is a, a slang term for an evaporative cooler. An evaporative cooler is simply going to take a media pad of some sort Okay, we might call them, they may use straw, they may use like a paper material or a cell deck material. And what they're going to do is swamp coolers typically work really well in dry conditions, okay, where you don't have a lot of humidity because what you need is you need to evaporate the water. So you're going to pull air across a, a pad that you've put water on. And the assumption is, is that that air is dry and it's going to um, cool the air essentially. Okay, so that's all a swamp cooler is. It's just an evaporative cooler. Now, we use them out here on the West Coast, um, not so much for comfort cooling. There is some situations where we'll use a swamp cooler and an evaporative cooler for comfort cooling. Most of the time, we'll use them for like a, a forced air or a makeup air unit. We, we do use those occasionally. Um, up in the desert area where it's really dry, they'll use them as comfort cooling. You can run a whole house on a swamp cooler. Um, but it's, it's tends to be a little muggy. The reason why they call them swamp coolers is because when you're in a house that has an evaporative cooler on it, it tends to feel like you're in a swamp. It's real muggy and thick and just, ugh, you know, so it'll be cold, but it'll just be ugh, gross. Um, but w we do use evaporative coolers for pre-coolers for air conditioning units. So you guys have probably seen some of my videos where I have, I don't know if you guys have seen those ones before, but I, I, I used to have a restaurant. We recently changed all their ACs, but we used to have uh, pre-coolers or just swamp coolers that would be directed at the air conditioning condensers. And it was essentially because they get temperatures of 120 degrees on the regular out there in the summertime. And so we would just take that swamp cooler and blow it on the condenser and hopefully drop the condensers, uh, you know, condensing temp 20 degrees. That was the hopes, you know, to make the unit more efficient. 
because if you guys don't already know, as the condensing temp rises, the efficiency drops. There's there's a happy window of when it's good, but once you get past the threshold of ridiculously hot condensing temps, the efficiency drops off the roof on that air conditioning unit. So I've also got, uh, I've made a couple videos on a refrigeration rack that I have that just has a bunch of equipment in it and it has a swamp cooler hanging off the side of it. Um, that one is also one where we're just pre-cooling the air going into that rack because they get 120 degrees in the summer. And a lot of those old condensing units can't handle that. They, they, you know, they're not sized adequately to handle 120 degree, um, outside air. So, you know, we'll put a pre-cooler on them essentially and just cool the air. It does make it more humid in that rack, but you know, it's just kind of one of the things you got to deal with out in the desert out there. And that's out in the Palm Springs area. I do a little bit of work out there. So, okay. Um, keep going in here see what else I'm missing guys see what I'm missing yeah swamp cooler is like dropping ice in your pants one of the cool things about those uh the the building that I have all the swamp coolers or I used to have all the swamp coolers was in the summertime when we would go do service work it was so miserable you'd have to literally go downstairs well if we had the swamp coolers out there. So you could just go stand in front of the swamp cooler and, you know, it cool the air 20 degrees. So if it was 120 outside, at least you had a hundred blown on you and it felt so much better than 120. So, um, that was one cool thing about the swamp coolers, but that's about it. Other than that, they're a mess. They got to, you know, if you use swamp coolers for pre-cooler units, they got to be maintained a lot. Sorry about the noise. My dog's on the ground behind me and she's sick. So I had to have her in the room with me. Um, yeah, I do need to have a logo there saying bigger picture. Yeah, something like that. Okay. Keep going up into here. I'm just looking through the chat. I don't want to go crazy, but I just want to see if I missed any questions here. So, um, I'm still liking that, uh, that M12 Milwaukee fuel drill driver that I have in my bag. That thing's still working out really nice. So. We'll see. I'm, I'm actually looking into buying some more of the Milwaukee stuff. I've been making the jump from the DeWalt stuff. Just just slowly trying to change a few things and try out some of their stuff. I've had a lot of people uh, talking about it. Yeah, I'm not seeing too much in there. So, yeah. Is that? Oh, cool. I'm going to have to look that up. Yeah, Rescue 911. See, thanks, Todd. I really appreciate that, man. Now, did you remember that episode or did you Google it right now? That's really interesting. Yeah, I remember that episode from when I was a kid. I'm going to write that down right now. See my dog in the background. She has the cone of shame on her right now. What's up, sweetie? My dog had a tumor and we had to go get a biopsy on it. So she's kind of coming out of sedation right now. So I don't know if you guys can see her there in the back. Um, rescue 911. I'm going to write this down so I don't forget it. Because I don't want to lose this chat. Uh, free on freak. Yeah, I'm going to look that up. Yeah, it was a really sad episode, if I remember right. So I remember that. I'm going to have to go watch that. Wow, that's funny. Okay. Um, yeah, so the Milwaukee stuff's working pretty good. Um, I'm going to turn around and talk to my dog for a sec. Lay down, sweetie. Come here. Lay down. Lay down on your bed. Lay down. All right. Um, let me go back into here. Jeffrey Manook, you said you meant to comment back on my field peeps post. Your fault, man. I got buys with the AC calls. Oh, I, I, it's all good, bro. No worries. Um, how often am I in the Riverside area? I live in the Riverside area. I live in Harupa Valley. So I'm always in Riverside. Um, okay, so let's talk about the... Uh, oh, you know what I'm really interested in is uh, Billy... Or not Billy. Um, Brent Ridley posted a picture of the M12 um, uh, pipe cutter. I want that. I'm going to... Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look into that for the M12 for, for when I weren't doing piping jobs, that thing looks cool. Not necessarily. I don't think for refrigeration piping, I don't know. I'd have to see it cut, but for plumbing pipe, yeah, I want to use that, that pipe cutter that they have. That definitely looks cool. No, I haven't tried the testo probes yet. Jonathan, I'm just not really a testo fan. Yeah. William Shatner was the narrator of rescue 911. That is right. Um, but yeah, I'm not a fan of the testo probes, but it's, I, I just, ha I'm not going to talk crap about them. I just haven't used them. Okay. I never made the jump to testo because their stuff just isn't really something I want to deal with. Um, let's talk about the, do I ever, oh, you know what? Someone had asked me back in here. I'm going to answer that real quick. Someone had asked me when I'm going back to S San Bernardino Valley college. So, um, 
I'm part of the RSCS Arrowhead chapter. So that's Refrigeration Service Engineers Society. Okay. We have chapters across the United States. I think to be honest with you, our chapter, the Arrowhead chapter and the Long Beach chapter here in Southern California are probably one of the most active chapters in the whole organization right now. But um, there is other chapters. Okay. Uh, but I'm very active in it and we actually do our, our classes the second Tuesday of every month at San Bernardino Valley college in Colton Rialto. I think it's in Colton is where it's at. Um, but, uh, so whoever, why I, I'm sorry, someone had asked me earlier when I was going back there. So we will have our next class in April, I believe, because March, their cla- we're not going to have a class there because the campus is closed for spring break. So our next RSCS class will be in April. I don't know if I'll be teaching the class. I think someone else is going to teach a class, but I regularly do classes or discussions, and I'm very active in that chapter. So so if anybody is in the local area and you want to come check stuff out, it's free training. Uh, we usually feed you. We usually have pizza and whatnot, and you do not have to be a member of our chapter to come to our meetings. So usually it's the second Tuesday of every month. If anybody in here is watching and is interested in checking out what we have to offer offer at the Arrowhead chapter of RSCS, you can simply send me an email to hvacrvideos at gmail.com. Hvacrvideos. I'm going to type it out in the chat at gmail.com. And send me an email and I will get you signed up in our newsletter. Okay. So if anybody is interested in this, uh, if you become, so if you're a subscriber, Jeffrey, it just depends on what area you're in. And if you, um, have an active chapter, all you have to do is find your active chapter. You can go to rses.org and they do have a place where it says find chapters and you can find who your, your chapter is for your area and find out if they're active. And then usually has a contact and you can find names and stuff. Um, okay. So Fred dog, you said, have I had any startup problems with the freezer evaporators with the QRC controller? You were told by tech support that you can't start them up with demand defrost because they need two weeks to learn itself. Okay. So that's very interesting, Fred. And there might be some truth in that. I will tell you that my personal experience with the QRC controllers, that's quick response controllers, is that I don't ever leave them in demand defrost or adaptive defrost because I have nothing but freeze up problems when they're in adaptive defrost. Okay. So, uh, for instance, the video that I just made and released today on the QRC controller, uh, we did this, st- I came back to do a follow up visit. When I filmed that video, we were there the day before installing that evaporator. We, we left the system on and, and I had another tech check the settings and he had left it in adaptive or demand defrost. I came back the next morning and the coil was frozen solid, iced up completely. So the adaptive defrost, uh, maybe there is some truth to letting it run for two weeks before you put it in adaptive defrost. But even after that, I've had nothing but problems on the heat craft QRCs. Um, I, I haven't really gone trying to move too many sensors and whatnot, uh, you know, to try to correct that. I've had some good luck with the adaptive defrost on the key to therm evap efficiency controllers. I tend to find the, the, the demand defrost works really well on those. Don't know what the difference is. I really haven't researched them enough, but yes, I have had problems with the QRC with demand defrost. It's, I'm not a fan of it. So if you guys don't know, I made it in the video. The QRC is the quick response controller. It is a beacon two board and it's just dumbed down. There's no communication with the condensing unit on the roof. So the only thing running up to the condensing unit is, uh, the refrigeration lines and that's it. Um, I'm assuming you guys have watched my video, but if you haven't, the QRC controller is essentially a temperature controller and a defrost clock built into one. Uh, what it does is it sells the customer on energy efficiency. That's the selling point of it. So if it works correctly, it has the ability to skip defrost instead of doing the typical four defrosts a day. It might do one to two defrosts every two to three days. So, you know, that's the whole selling point. And it can stage fans and do all kinds of weird things. So, okay. Um, keep going down into here. So, yeah, I did did do that video. And then I also did the update video on the key to therm. Uh, Wi-Fi service tool. And I thought that was really, really cool. I, I was very impressed with the Wi-Fi service tool for the Keto Therm EVAP efficiency controller because it gave me the ability to not have to give my service techs a computer to carry around in their vans and have to worry about it getting stolen out of their vans. Now we can just give them a $200 Wi-Fi service tool. And if they go to work on a Keto Therm 
evap efficiency controller or any other key to therm uh, rack controller or anything like that they can simply it doesn't work the wi-fi service tool doesn't work on their temperature controllers for the regions though you have to use a different tool to get wi-fi capabilities but i digress uh, all i have to do is keep a $200 Wi-Fi service tool in my vans. I just put one in each one of my vans. And then my guys, when they go out, all they do is plug in the Wi-Fi service tool, navigate to an IP address, and boom, they can control everything on the controller and see the graphs. And the cool thing about the graphs is, is that you can see problems before you even see, you know, before there's even a problem. So let's say if there's a refrigerant shortage, but it's only low the winter charge, right? And it has a headmaster. Well, during the day out here in Southern California, it's warm. It's 60, 70 degrees out during the day. But then at nighttime, it drops into the you know 30s and 50s. So the headmaster bypasses at night, but then doesn't bypass during the day. So you go up and if you're not really digging into a system, you may not see a refrigerant shortage on a system like that. But if you have a graph in the key to therm controller, you can look at the graph and notice that, hey, at nighttime, the temperatures trend up, but then in the daytime, they go down, you know, and then that could say, hey, I need to look into that some more. And that's a cool feature of the, the the real-time graphs, you know? So that way, I think it has 30, 30 days of graphing data built into the controller, and I think that's really cool. So I'm kind of becoming a fanboy with the key to therm stuff. So let's wait until something bites me in the butt. But so far, I'm really liking their stuff. So, all right. Um, okay. I see you guys are having a conversation in there. Okay. Also, QRC, you don't need to install thermostat or pump down solenoid. Saves on labor, even though the evaporators cost a little more. That is correct, Fred. Uh, the install on the QRCs is actually super easy. You just run a line set, purge with nitrogen, make your connections, move a sensor. You know, you, you take the suction line temperature sensor out when you braze in the suction line. Um, it's super easy. No need to mount an expansion valve sensing bulb. No need to fuss with that. I will say that I haven't had really any refrigeration problems with the QRC controllers. Knock on wood, I haven't had expansion valve problems. The only thing I've had is freeze-up problems on the uh, the walk-in freezers when you do the demand defrost. That's just the problems I've had. Um, so, you know, these, these smart evaporators, they're the future. This is how it's going. It's already happening in the air conditioning side. It's happening in... Uh, you know, many splits, we're using electronic expansion valves. We can control capacity better. We can do all kinds of cool stuff. So this 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 technology is really hitting our trade. What's interesting is this technology is hitting our trade at the moment that we are short, shorter than ever on service technicians. So we've got an influx of new blood coming into the trade right now, right? All young people coming in and we've got all this new technology and we've got a problem. We're in for a world of hurt, and it hasn't gotten to the worst yet. We're still coming up to the worst because with all this new technology and with the lack of employees and we've got a lot of new techs, we're going to have a lot of incorrectly installed systems. We're going to, and it's, it's slowly building up right now, but it's going to get worse. So, but it is, it is the way it's going. So we have to embrace it. So us guys that are, you know, thorough and want to be thorough and want to do things the right way, we're going to be doing good. We're going to be in demand. So that's, that's good for us, right? So, okay. Um, Manuel Pounce, you said, how about a reality TV show about HVAC and crawl spaces and restaurants, four different crews and their families. It'll be informative and entertaining. Uh, it's already in there. Um, we've already got two of those out here. Um, Ted, Ted Cook was in here earlier. He's anti-DIY HVAC. He's got a little reality show going on his YouTube channel. Uh, if you just look up anti-DIY HVAC, he's working on a reality show. And then also Corbett Lunsford is doing a reality show also a little bit different, but it's about um, building performance. So there is two of them out there, two reality shows right now, and you can find them both on YouTube. So if you just look up Corbett Lunsford and if you look up anti-DIY HVAC, uh, both of those on YouTube, you should be able to... Uh, to see i believe um ted's reality show is going to be called the cowboys of hvac so if you search the cowboys of hvac on youtube or go to ted's channel anti-diy hvac you should be able to find it i don't know if you're still in here ted i know he was earlier but i haven't seen him chatting for a few minutes so there is some uh some some reality stuff but yes i do agree that those reality shows would be funny so um okay Let's see what else i got it's only going to get worse, though, commercial refrigeration and stuff. So it's the future. All right. 
<laughs> That's funny. I'm just reading your guys' stuff. Um, okay. So, guys, um, I think we're going to get ready to end this unless you guys got some questions. Um, I've about rambled everything I've got in. So if any of you guys have questions, Pepe, good father. You're wondering if this is a career you're interested in. So I don't know if you just came in here, but I covered that a few minutes ago. I think that this is a great career if anybody is interested in it. But you need to be mechanically inclined. You need to be a go-getter. Uh, you do need to be um, driven. And I highly suggest you do so, okay? If you get into trade school, uh, I would suggest go enroll in a community college HVAC program. At least get started in one. Take a semester or so of trade school at nighttime. You don't have to do anything crazy. Don't pay a ton of money at a private trade school. Just pay a little bit. Pay for a semester. Take a beginning refrigeration class. If it seems interesting to you, once you finish that class, then apply with a company. By you already finishing one class, it shows initiative that you're interested in the trade, and that makes you even more hireable. Continue your education and learn. I think this is a very good trade. So, um, yeah, thanks, guys. Uh, there is a trailer for, for anti-DIYs thing, so check it out. The Ninjas of HVAC. There you go, Adam. Okay. All right, gentlemen, thank you guys so very much. I'm going to go ahead and end this. I really appreciate you guys coming in here. Uh, yeah, that is funny. I really appreciate it. Anybody, if you guys have questions, send me an email to hvacrvideos at gmail.com. I'll get to the questions that are popping up right now. I'll stay in for a few more minutes, but let me just type this in here real quick. So hvacrvideos at gmail.com. If any of you guys have questions, just send me an email. Okay. I'll try to get to them. Has a customer ever scammed me? Yes. Yes. I've had customers not pay me. I've had businesses, construction companies uh, hire me as a sub and then not pay me and then close their company, file bankruptcy and start a new company and then try to hire me again. Yep, had that. Nope, not did it again. So plenty of those. Okay, so here, great, great question. Brian Milburn, I love this one. He said, what are my thoughts on leaving a three and one on a unit instead of getting the OEM start components? Okay, so a three and one. What we typically have in the refrigeration industry is a three-in-one start kit, okay? You can get them. They're made by several manufacturers. Uh, Supco makes one. A couple different people make them, okay? Essentially, it's a start capacitor, a potential relay, and an overload. Uh, it's not an overload. It's a start capacitor and a potential relay built into one device. And what we can use them as is if we have starting components that have failed on a compressor, we can put a three-in-one on there, and we can typically get it started up. So... The way that three and ones are rated, if you look at the three and one, and I wish I had a picture of one right now, but they're basically rated in horsepower. Okay, so you pick your voltage. If you've got 115 volts, then it says what what's the horsepower of your compressor? Is it a third horsepower? Is it a quarter horsepower? And they're usually like a third to a quarter, or or a quarter to a third, whatever. And then uh, you know half to three quarter or whatever. So it, they they say that one three and one can work for multiple compressors. Okay. And it will start a compressor. I will give it that. But what I challenge you to do is to take that, let's say a Tecumseh compressor, an AEA 4440 YXA. Okay, take that compressor. I believe that's a third horsepower medium temp refrigeration compressor, 115 volts, if I remember right. So if you take that and look at the factory starting components, let's just say that we have a, I know this isn't right, but let's say we have 189 um, to 200 and something start capacitor. Okay, that's the factory OEM one. That's actually not the right one for that AEA compressor, but I'm just saying a capacitor, okay? If you take apart that three-in-one start kit, strip the labels off of it, it actually has a normal capacitor on there and it has the microfarad rating of that capacitor. That capacitor's microfarad rating is not the right one for that compressor most of the time. It will start it, but it's not the right size. So, I'm not a fan of leaving a three in one on a system. Now, if it gets me through a weekend, sure, but I will go back. I'll make the customer sign off that they don't want me to come back. Three in ones are compressor killers if, in my opinion, if you don't go back and put the right starting components on. Because let's say it works for three compressors, okay, but it might only be the right start capacitor for one of those compressors, but it might be just big enough to start one of them and the other one. 
Okay. So it, it, over time, it's going to overheat that start winding or whatever. Okay. So I'm not a fan of leaving three in one start capacitors or start kits on a system permanently. Okay. Unless the customer signs off on it and completely understands that this thing's on its way out. Okay. Most of the time you can order factory starting components from the manufacturer. Um, and when I say factory, this is something that I go back and forth with my supply houses because I'll call the supply house and say, Hey, I need the factory starting components for this. And they'll say, yeah, I got them. And then I go there and they're aftermarket starting components. No, if I'm going to put start components back in the system, I want the factory ones. I want the caps to be on them. I want everything to fit in there like they're brand new from the factory. So personal preference, okay? To each their own. Some people love those three-in-ones, but just not me, okay? Um, keep going. Let's see what else I missed here. Yes, yeah, so you, can, you can look on the three-in-ones, so... Yeah, the AEA 4440YXA Total Tech. We don't get to use those as much anymore. Remember, the supply houses, they used to buy those in bulk. And you could buy a compressor. It didn't have a box or anything because they would buy them in, in bulk with a pallet. they basically buy the pallet because there were so many of those out there. So, um, yeah, three in one is temporary. So, all right. Um, yeah. So Gary Black, the interesting thing is, as you say, the sensors on the Beacon 2 systems or the QRC, the QRC and the Beacon 2 systems, I think it's the same board. It's the Beacon 2 board. But um, a lot of times you can use, uh, first off, if you don't already know, most of the QRC systems, they come with an extra sensor inside the coil, which also is kind of funny because it tells you how many sensors they expect to lose that they actually ship that unit with an extra sensor for you know from the factory but they do come with that extra sensor i highly suggest that if you're doing a lot of work on the heat craft stuff or on the key to therm stuff that you keep their sensors in your truck but a lot of times if you just ohm out the sensors you'll find out that they're just like a 10k ohm sensor or a 20k ohm sensor and you can use all kinds of different sensors that you already have in your truck whatever the the, the resistance value of that sensor is sometimes you can grab like a ronco temperature controller sensor from your truck to get you by you know, depending on which one you're working on and what the resistance value of it is. So you always want to check that. Don't just assume that you can use any sensor, but just pay attention to the resistance value. And it might, you know, you, I wouldn't suggest leaving another sensor on one of those, but it might get you through a weekend. So there's also some some things you can do to get by. Um, yeah, I'm not an expert on those, but there's some other videos out there that you can do to get by by bypassing some things and different stuff. So, okay. Keep going. Reading schematics, Bill Nolier, you said, where's a good place to get better knowledge reading schematics? That is a hard one, man. That one, you, I really can't tell you a book that's going to tell you how to read a schematic. You're really going to need to get hands-on experience with that, um, with someone explaining it to you, and you just got to break them down. Schematics are difficult in the very beginning. I mean, they used to be Chinese to me, and, you know, they just under, I just understand. I mean, you know, the basics that they teach you when you're in school is, is learning how to read a ladder diagram. So you start from the top, you work your way down, that kind of stuff, understanding that labels of relays mean this. But, you know, every manufacturer has a different way. So that's a hard one, man. I don't really know that there's a book that I know of. Maybe someone in the chat knows of a book that'll help you, but personally, I think it's just something you got to you gotta be with other people and have them explain them to you. That's the only way I could think of reading schematics to learn. So, All right. Um, let's see what else. Where is a good place? Okay, so I read that. Um, will I teach guys? Will I? Will you guys teach more on smart evaporators? You know, as as more smart evaporator stuff come in, I'm still learning myself. So as I learn more, definitely. You know, and there's lots of super smart guys in this chat right now. You know, I'm sure some of them will raise their hands and be willing to talk to people if people are interested. So, um, also suggest you check out the HVAC School Facebook group. There's lots of great information on there too. See you later, Brian. Um, how many texts do I have? Jesus, you said that. Um, I have four trucks out on the road, including mine. So I have three texts besides myself. So we're a very small company. Um, what is the craziest thing I have seen in a freezer? I'll tell you one. It was a beer walk-in and I walked into a restaurant and the customer I don't even know how they got this much dry ice, but they filled the entire giant beer walk-in with dry ice. I could, and dry ice, if you don't know, is uh, CO2. It's frozen CO2, okay? So it's very dangerous. 
and you know that displaces the oxygen in your lungs and it will basically you won't even i mean it's it's so dangerous it's like carbon monoxide so i open the door to the beer walk and because they said my beer walk is not working emergency service call and i go out there and i open the door and i could taste it i could taste it in the air it's not as bad as carbon monoxide because carbon monoxide you can't really taste or anything but you could just taste the bubbles like it, i don't know how to explain how much i could taste the 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 dry ice but it was so dangerous and i remember being so upset with the manager i told him i said all of that dry ice needs to be out of that walk-in before i'll step foot in there and then i told him you're nuts for filling that walk-in with dry ice like i don't even know how your your guys have to hold their breath run in and grab a piece and run out they had i don't again i don't even know where they got all that dry ice from but so dangerous um jesus you said how long have i worked in the field i have worked in the field since two officially since 2002 but i grew up working for my dad from junior high school which would have been 1995 96 something like that uh even as a little kid i i I remember sitting on my dad's bucket holding this flashlight when i was probably five or six years old so i grew up in the trade but officially i started working in 2002 so thanks for coming in guys that are leaving i really appreciate it um I'll hang in here for a few more minutes if you guys want to. So if anybody else has questions. Okay, there was one that broke it down in rice and beans. It was called Troubleshooting for HVACR. Guess what? I'm confused about Alexander. Is that a book? It said it broke it down in rice and beans. I need some more information on that, Alexander. What the hell are you talking about? Um, Yeah, that's a good point, Gary. Gary Black, you said you hate when a previous tech uses the spare sensor and doesn't order another one. Heck yeah, that's a nightmare. Um, that's definitely. Converting a cooler to a freezer. Been there, done that a bunch of times. Uh, that's going to be a huge one, though. I mean, you, you'll luck out nowadays. These days, a long time ago, there would be a difference between um, a walk-in build as, f- as far as like the insulation goes. But nowadays, most walk-ins and freezers the, the the walls and everything in the panels are pretty much all sized the same so in the past you might have a problem with the insulation not being enough for a walk-in cooler to be used as a walk-in freezer but i mean as far as converting from a walk-in cooler to a freezer put a new condensing unit and a new evaporator coil uh yeah and call it a day that'd be an easy one converting the other way might be a little more difficult because a lot of people think that they can just use a walk-in freezer condensing unit to run a walk-in cooler and you can you can run into some problems if you try to do that. If your compressor is not sized correctly, you can have some overheating issues and different things. So, in a perfect world, to go the other way too, to convert from a freezer to a cooler, you should change the condensing unit also. So, and in a perfect world, change the evaporator also. But there is ways you can do it. I've done it before. So, um, good books to sharpen the skills. Hey Zeus, yes, commercial refrigeration for air conditioning technicians by Dick Wurz. It's a great book. It's the third edition. Um, it it's for refrigeration technicians though that that are already air conditioning. It's for air conditioning guys that want to learn refrigeration. That is a great book, and it will sharpen your skills for sure. All right. Um, when starting out as a tech, Clayton, you said how many hours can you plan on working when you start out? Well, it depends on where you work, what part of the trade you're getting in, and what you know what climate you're in. So here in the West Coast in Southern California, uh, in the summertime. We're in restaurant refrigeration, so we stay pretty busy. In the summertime, we're going to get about 50 to 60 hours a week, sometimes more, but average is about 50 to 60 hours a week. And in the wintertime, we're going to get 30 to 40 hours a week. Uh, And that's pretty average for a refrigeration, like a restaurant refrigeration company. Um, If you're in the supermarket side, I think you're pretty much going to be busy all year long and you're never going to be able to live and you're going to go home and you're going to cry and you're going to, yeah. No, I'm just joking. But the, the, uh, the supermarket guys, those guys work their butts off. Um, residential guys, you're going to have slow times and busy times depending on the area. So there's all kinds of different stuff. You need to just kind of find what you like and, you know, and, and, and find a good company and you'll stay pretty busy. So, okay. Gene K HVACR. I have used dye. I am not a fan. I'm, I'm someone that's going to preach against dye. Okay. I have used it in a couple situations, where the customer was totally on board with it. They understood what they were getting themselves into. It's a system. It's a restaurant refrigeration system. It's a remote rack, and it's got multiple evaporator coils, and I swear to you, we have leaks 
so many times that it got ridiculous. So we finally had to put some dye in the system. I was not a super fan of it. I have it marked and labeled and we only use one certain gauge set for it. So yes, I have in a certain situation, but I, I try not to use dye if I don't have to, because that stuff is a mess. It gets everywhere. So um, yeah, if at all possible, use good leak detectors. There's so many other better ways to do it. Last resort, use dye, but I have done it, but it's just not something I really would suggest for anybody else. So, okay. Um, yeah, Marcos, that, that's all I've heard. I've never done supermarket stuff. I've heard just basically you're going to work until you die, basically. But I mean, in all reality, I mean, it, it keeps you busy and makes you really good money. So whatever you like to do, and, and it's very technical. It's not the easy stuff like I work on, the little refrigerators and stuff. You've got some pretty heavy duty technical stuff. So uh, the restaurant, refer I mean, the, the supermarket techs, man, those guys, they're, they're, they're smart dudes. So, um, okay. Um, Coolbot, Dustin, you said, if I'm familiar with Coolbot controls, basically controlled BL. I, I've seen videos and stuff on them, Dustin, about the Coolbot. Um, I get the concept. Essentially, it's just going to, yeah, m it's just going to increase the run time of a window air conditioner. So basically, you, you're going to go through compressors pretty quick if you try to use a window air conditioner to run like a little uh, a meat cooler for like deer or something like that. A lot of hunters will get a window shaker. They'll get like a big one ton window shaker and then get a cool bot system on it and then build like a little enclosure in their garage or whatever for like a meat cooler for their their game meats and whatnot yeah i've seen people i've seen videos on it it's interesting i mean it's it's there's nothing like crazy technical about the cool bot stuff essentially it's just it's it's just running the air conditioner so long that they add defrost and stuff to it so there's nothing crazy technical about it you can anybody can take a window shaker and put a temperature controller on it in a defrost clock the whole point of the cool bot is, is that it just has sensors and it knows when to defrost and stuff so um yeah i've seen them you know um never used one never worked on one uh, honestly if i if someone called me to work on a system that had a window shaker in it i'd probably tell them to call someone else but that, not trying to sound crappy or anything it's just I, I don't want to deal with that kind of stuff so um okay so jesus you said what can a refrigeration tech look forward to being paid it depends on where you're at so restaurant refrigeration if you're if you're a tech that knows your stuff out here in southern california it just depends you're going to be from the 25 to 35 range um without getting into a supervisor position or some kind of a management position. Uh, you know, you can get above 35 if you get into like a, a management position or a senior tech position and make more, but you're typically not going to get hired on at 35 an hour. You know, you better know your stuff before you do. And then once you get into the bigger industrial stuff, you can make 55, $60 an hour, depending on that. And the supermarket guys, maybe one of them can answer in here. I'm sure they make pretty good money too. So, um, Clayton, are you asking me? I love my job if you're asking me, dude. I don't know if you're asking me or someone else. I absolutely love it. I, I enjoyed so much today being able to go work on a, a refrigerator it, because it was something different. I, I tend to work on the same stuff all the time. Even though it looks different in my videos, It's I work for the same restaurant, so it tends to get a little monotonous. But today I went to a new place and it was bitching. So I don't know if you were asking me, though. But um, Have I ever had the CLO on a package unit? lock the unit out, but you can't find the problem. Yes, I have. Um, remember Dino on the, the carrier package units, you've got three limit switches on there. You have a freeze stat, you have a high pressure and a, a loss of charge switch. Okay. So with those three limit switches it, or you can have an amperage problem. So if the, the CLO board doesn't see amperage, it can lock it out if it, or if any of the pressure controls opens, it can lock it out too. So yeah, I've, I've run into problems where you can't figure out what it is. Um, if you're really, really having a problem, you know, some of the new uh, wireless smart probes and different things, they have data logging capabilities. So I'd suggest you try logging the data, like leaving some smart probes on there overnight or something like that and having it trend the data. Um, there's all kinds of different things you can do. Um, there's those tattletale things that you can put on that'll tell you if a pressure switch opens or whatever. Um, there's a few different things. So, but yeah, I, I have run into those CLO boards being a pain in the butt sometimes. Okay. Would I hire and train? Yeah, I'd be open to it. Jesus. I mean, I'm, I'm currently in the process of possibly hiring a new guy right now. I've already interviewed him and I think he's going to come on with us. Um, 
so it's going to be a situation where I'm going to train him. But, you know, I'm, I'm probably not going to hire anybody else for a while because he's going to have to ride with me for a very long time. So that's kind of a commitment on my part. But, yeah, I'm always willing to hire and train for sure. Um, okay. I'm just another service tech, Jesus. I'm not some super smart dude. I'm just a guy that's made a lot of mistakes and I learned from him. Okay. There's much smarter people than I. There's just a, there's a lot smarter people than I too out there that are service techs that just haven't picked up a camera and started making YouTube videos. So, um, thanks so much, Jesus. Am I married? Yes, I am. I am married. I have a wife and I have uh, two girls. I have a 12 year old and a nine year old. So, all right. Can I recommend an affordable data logger? Well, no. I mean, I I will tell you the only data logger that I know of is um, I've never used like, I'm trying to think of the company that makes data loggers. Dixon. Dixon Controls. D-I-C-K-S-O-N. They make some data loggers and then there's like hobo data loggers. You can go to truetechtools.com and they have some data loggers on there. I really can't vouch for any of them. Um, if you do go to truetechtools.com, there's a couple guys that have offer codes out there. You can choose any one of them. There's shop talk, there's get schooled, there's know it all. Um, there's tool pros. There's, there's a bunch of cool guys, other YouTubers that have, uh, discount codes. So if you do go to true tech tools, use one of those offer codes. Um, I do know that the new field piece S man 480 manifold that I've been testing and kind of talking about on social media, it is going to have a data logging feature. So if you wanted a data log with it, you could leave your manifold behind and it will record the information. So, um, but, uh, you know, that's, we're still testing or not testing, but we're still working with that one. So that one hasn't been released yet. Okay. Um, <laughs> right on his is, um, Cool. Yeah. HVAC is a great thing, Clayton. I really think you should get into it. Um, I think it's a great trade and it, uh, it's, it's totally fulfilling and I enjoy it very much. Um, I wish that there was more people in the trade that were interested and wanted to learn. So, you know, the fact that you guys in here are saying that you'd be willing to learn and all that stuff, that's great. I hope you are because you're going to find someone that wants to teach you. Uh, we, we are definitely lacking in, in techs that want to really do the work and be thorough. So um, it's a good time for you guys because you're going to find great work depending on where you're at. So, okay. Um, what's the downside on dies? Well, first off, you know, you really shouldn't put anything in a system that doesn't belong in there, that didn't come in there, okay? The only thing that should be in a, in a refrigeration system is the oil that came in the system and the refrigerant, and that's it. Additives and different things, they're not meant for the system, okay? A lot of times the additives are a quick fix to a big problem. They might, uh, you know, supposedly you can add an additive and it's going to make it operate more efficient, okay? There's all kinds of different things. I would highly suggest you search out a podcast that Brian Orr did where he interviewed, um, oh good gosh, please don't do this to me right now. Uh, where he interviewed, I'm forgetting his name right now, John Pastorello with Refrigeration Technologies. It was on the HVACR School podcast with Brian Orr, and he interviewed John Pastorello from Refrigeration Technologies, and they talked about what belongs in a refrigeration system and what doesn't. And basically, the synopsis of it is refrigerant and oil that came in the system belong in the system. Okay. So, um, additives, they, they, they're not meant for there. A lot of times the additives are snake oils, not all of them, but I'm just saying there's a lot of additives out there that they claim they do certain things when they really don't. And John has, um, he, he's, if you listen to him, he's analyzed a lot of those additives and find out that there's nothing really to them, but this or that. It's really interesting to hear what's in some of those additives. So I highly suggest you guys search out that podcast. Uh, it's HVACR school and it's just search up John Pastorello refrigeration technologies on Brian's website and you should be able to find that podcast. So, um, yeah, I really don't know about the, the hobos wired. I was just kind of naming ones. So, yeah, they definitely ruin gauges and they get everywhere. So the dyes do. So um, how demanding is the trade on the body? Okay, it is very demanding on the body. You have to take care of yourself. It's so easy to just drive down the road and eat fast food all day and drink sodas all day. And it it that is that is the worst thing you can do. 
if you're going to be in this trade, it's, it's, you got to be drinking waters and you got to be eating properly and not eating sugars. Um, you know, it's, and I hate to say it, but smoking is horrible for this trade too, because you know, you, you got to be in good health. It's a very demanding, demanding trade, and it will beat you up if you don't take care of your body, wear your knee pads, use your kneeling pads, wear your stupid sun hats. Like I wear, okay. They look dumb and silly, but they'll protect you from the sun. Skin cancer is no joke. Um, so yes, this trade will beat you up, but there's ways you can prevent it from beating you up. And that's by taking care of your body and being in good physical shape and taking care of your health. So, um, okay. Yeah. Fix, fixing. I mean, it's definitely good. You just gotta, you gotta be cautious, man. Going to your college this week to ask about your training, any tips? No, just, just find a, 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 you know, sign up for a class and, and just understand this may not be for you. Okay. So go take a semester and just, you know, check it out. If you don't like it, if you don't think it's going to be something interesting, then, you know, at least you're not too far and deep. And once your semester done, then go try to apply at jobs and say, Hey, look, I've already been going to school. I've, I've tried this and I'm interested and they'll hire you as an apprentice and you'll work your way up. So, um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Duluth does make pants with built-in knee pads. I carry a kneeling pad with me very, you know, lately. So you have to be disciplined and easy. And, and uh, trust me guys, I'm telling you from experience, I I'm overweight. Okay. I'm not obesely overweight, but I'm 202 pounds and I'm 5'11. So I'm about 40 to 60 pounds overweight. And it's because I'm not as active as I should be. Um, I need to do better. Okay. So nobody's perfect. Um, and I eat fast food, like I shouldn't eat fast food and you know, it is what it is. I'm sure my cholesterol is high. My sodium levels are high, but, um, the one thing I did do is I gave up soda. I don't drink soda anymore. And that was a huge thing. It's been almost two years since I've had soda and that has helped my health, but I've also replaced soda with like juice. So when I come home, we have like simply lemonade and I probably drink two cups of that. So I probably just replaced the soda with what, you know, the sugar and stuff. So, um, what helped me and a lot of people, it was really gross at first, but what helped me with the stopping drinking of soda was to drink carbonated water. So it sounds gross and I know it's horrible, but soda water. What I do is um, you can buy them from Costco. They have like natural mineral waters that are carbonated and then just add lime juice to them. I don't even add sugar, just lime juice or lemon juice. And I just drink those and you got to kind of, sorry, my dog is in the background, but you got to kind of, um, you got to kind of, you know, just bear with the first couple weeks when you drink them, but then you'll get used to them and they'll start replacing soda and it's just carbonated water. That's all it is. So, um, yeah, uh, Dustin, it's, it's definitely cold. California is not too bad. So boilers and hydronics, that's definitely something good. All right, guys. Well, as you guys can see right there, my dog wants to go out. She must have to go to the bathroom. So I'm going to go ahead and end this. I really, really appreciate this. Okay, guys. Um, I will, uh, yeah, I've seen that, Adam. I've seen the spin drift thing. So, all right, well, I'm going to let you guys go. I'm going to go ahead and end this, and uh, we'll see you guys next time, okay? Send me some emails. Thanks again, guys. Uh, you, well, let me see here. Hold on. She's got a, the cone of shame on her head right now, so. She's over there. Sorry, you can't really see too well because, Ava, come here. Come here, baby. Yeah, it's going to be hard to see. But anyways, all right, guys, thanks so much. We'll see you guys next time, okay? All right, I'm going to go ahead and...